Greetings, Mars Shared. Welcome to episode 100 of my modded Factoria playthrough. In this episode, we need to build the huge ore crystallizer setup to handle all of our extra stone products, as well as go through the logic to control when to turn them on and off. Enjoy. These things right here, and we need to build them in their entirety because we need to use logic to determine which one to run. So I need to build a bunch of machines and then we'll figure out where to place them. It'll be very similar to this, really. It's pretty much exactly the same thing. It's just instead of 10, there needs to be 160 of them <laughs> times three. <laughs> so it's going to be huge. So it's, yeah, it's probably like one, two, three or somewhere around here. We don't really want to take up this space in case this wants to expand down, but that water right here is a prime candidate for landfill. So we can keep all this stuff kind of close together. I don't want to keep expanding out in this direction. I want to try to keep it to its own side as much as possible. All right, we finally got our 480. And as it so happens, that fits exactly in a chest. So in the beginning, I was handcrafting these. And then after a while, I'm like, screw that. This is Factorio. I'm just going to put a machine here to handle it. But the problem is these machines take 50 steel plates each. That's a huge amount of steel for uh, this stage of the factory. So I uh, let it run. I was running around chopping down some trees and whatever. But then I got bored, just went and ate dinner. <laughs> I don't know, it took it like an hour or two to produce all of these. <laughs> but we're good now. So, let's create our pattern here. As far as its shape, we probably want it to be kind of long and narrow, because I'm thinking I want to put it here. And we're going to have three of them, so we kind of want to put them like that, like that, and then like that, maybe? It's going to be similar to this, really. It's not going to be quite exactly the same, but similar enough. Let's see what it looks like. And 160 of these is only going to produce 12 iron and 12 copper a second. So it's going to be quite slow. So yellow inserters, yellow belts. Seems good. Uh-oh. And quiet. <laughs> Nothing we could do about that. Well, warehouse is full. We have our alert here. Uh, nothing that can be done. <laughs> Nowhere to put it, unfortunately. System is just going to clog up. But we are right on the cusp of being able to dump that into making resources. So this is well-timed. So we've got... 10 here and kind of flip it around to make 20 so we need seven more of these I wonder if we should do four next to each other and then four next to each other again we need to connect all of these that seems pretty good so that's a uh, half of a setup of one ore group. It's good enough. We don't need to build a bunch of them. We can just grab that. And let's go get the crawler. Because we have a lot of construction to do. And we need to load up on all of the machines that we need. Let's see. I'm gonna probably need a ton of belts, a ton of power poles, and a couple of lights. And inserters too. I guess we'll need one inserter for every machine, so if we have 480 machines, that's 480 inserters. That's like 500, so just grab it. And probably a couple of belts for every machine. A thousand. Sure, why not? And a power pole for every other machine. Let's 
Let's go with that. Probably need a bunch of landfill as well, but let's see how much space all this stuff takes up first. But let's uh, try to slice it in here. This space is fairly open. So we could probably start it somewhere around here. We don't want to cover up that patch if possible. I think that's crotinium. I don't know, phosphorite. So less important, but still. Don't want to cover it if we don't have to. Let's go with that. Can already tell we're going to need a ton of landfill. So we got this going, but we need to do it a second time to get our 160. Which means somewhere right around here is where we want the landfill to go. Yeah, that'll work. And definitely out of landfill. Let's get some power in here so we can kind of see. And paste it again. I don't know. These might impact this rail a little bit. We'll have to see. And it wouldn't be the end of the world if I just had to chop off a couple of machines just to make it not impact here. I don't know, it's gonna be pretty close. There we go. 160 crystallizers. That's for iron and copper. So now we need to do the lead and tin set. Fortunately, we have to have a set for each one. Technically, this is all we need, air quotes, all, <laughs> that we need to cover the entire factory's output. But the problem is, is we have three different potential recipes we'd want to use. So for that to work properly and for those recipes to handle the full output of the factory means we have to triple this up here, unfortunately. Now we got to get the last set. Hey, it fits. A little bit of room to spare. Well, might as well smooth out some of this landfill here. And we got to get all these machines set. So the second set is lead and tin. And the last one we need to set for silicon and silver. And there we go. That's a fairly modest setup. <laughs> okay. So, how do we control all of this? Well, off camera, I created a nice little set of circuits. <laughs> and unfortunately, this was as simple as I could make it. Let's see, let's rotate it this way. And just put it anywhere. I doubt anything's ever going to go here, so we can just kind of place this right there. And I will try to explain it. I made this as simple as possible, and based on my understanding of the circuit network, this is the best I can do for this. Let's see, we need to connect this. There we go. And I'll try to go through what all this does, but it might make more sense if we run the input signal to this. So, the input signals we need, <laughs> so huge, the input signals we need are the status of the warehouses up here. All of these, which is this line. We might have to dodge some other circuit networks if we don't want them all to compete with each other here. But let's see what we can do. 
it'll be easier to explain what all the circuits are doing if we actually have a signal going into it. I mean, it's not that big a deal to combine signals. Uh, I'm just trying to avoid overcomplicating things and having too many signals on one wire. There we go, we made it. Okay. So let's go through what this does. First we have to ask, what do we want it to do? Well, we have three different methods of processing our mineral sludge, in other words, our extra byproducts, into ores. But which one do we want? Do we want iron and copper, lead and tin, or silicon and silver? From a practical perspective, basically what we need to do is look at all of the available ores that we have and figure out which one do we have the least of, and that's the one we want to produce. But we don't want to produce too much of something that we already have too much of. So there's some logic that has to go into this. So let's kind of go down the line of what it does. Well, you can look at the beginning, which has every signal that we have, and then what comes out the other side? One silicon. So basically, this logic is telling us we need to be producing silicon. And if you look at the input signals, out of all of them, silicon is the one that is the lowest. So it is working properly. So how does it work? Well, we've got six arithmetic combinators here. You can go to iron here. And each one takes the input signal, multiplies it by one, and then outputs the same signal. And what does that do? Well, it doesn't do anything. But what it does, if you look at the input signals over here on the side of the screen, we have all of the input signals, but then the output signal is only iron. So you can do that multiplies by one trick to remove any signals you don't want to process. So since only these six ores, iron, copper, lead, tin, silicon, and silver, are the only ones that we can produce using the crystallizers, then there's no point in having all those other signals involved. So by doing this, we pull each individual signal but that's not good enough. We have to do a check to it. And if we follow iron down, we need to check to see, is this signal under 80,000? If it is, then good. If not, then bad. In other words, we don't want to produce too much. So with iron, since iron is less than 80,000, it sends out a green signal. And since copper is less, then 80,000, it sends out a green signal. And there's two signals. And then they're matched right here, so this is kind of a U of signals. So then on the bottom, what does it do? Well, if you have two green signals, then you can output that signal. So since we have two green squares, it means we can output iron and we can output copper. You might think, well, that's kind of weird. Well, let's go to this next one. We have 32,000 lead, which goes through, and then it checks. Do we have less than 80,000 of lead? We do, so it sends a green square, but then tin is 80,000. And since 80,000 is not less, it does not send out a green square. So then when it gets to this point, since we don't have two green squares, we only have one, then neither of these signals is output. And that is because Whenever we produce one of these pairs, like if we produce lead, then we have to produce tin. We don't have a choice. And since we already are overloaded on tin, it means no matter how much we might want to make lead, we just can't because we're overloaded on tin. So that's why they're kind of split up in pairs here. And the same process happens with silicon and silver, but they're both under, so they pass through. So this first part, splits off the necessary signal that we need to process. 
and then it checks to see if it's under 80,000. And if it is, it passes through. So then you hover over here, and you can see now we only have four signals, iron, copper, silver, and silicon. The other two have been removed because they are not something we need to calculate anymore. And is it possible to remove some of these combinators and use, uh, you know, each commands and whatnot? Maybe. But I found that some of those commands didn't work very well. So that's kind of why I had to have so many of these. So let's go down the list here. What's the next thing that it does? It does in each. And it says, for each signal, is it greater than iron? If so, output an iron. Only one. So what it's doing is it's basically calculating how many of these signals is that signal lower than. Since iron is the biggest signal, it outputs nothing because nothing is less than it. Copper is the second biggest signal, so it outputs one copper. And then we get two for silver and three for silicon. In other words, everything is greater than silicon, so that's why we get a three for the output. To lead and tin and a byproduct of using this method is that it says four for each because these signals don't exist. So of course, they are the lowest out of all four. Now, you might think, well, why not just use one of these other signals? The problem is, is it doesn't really output properly. Where even if we use everything, it's still outputting a one. And then if we do anything, it's still outputting a one. <laughs> and it's in part because of the way that it calculates. If all input signals meet this condition, the output will be true. And since this signal doesn't exist, this is a true calculation. Then if we do anything, if any of the input signals meet the condition, it will output true. And it's false if there's no inputs. That outputs a one as well. So that's why I did each for all of these. So there is a method to the madness, but there are certainly better people out there than me when it comes to circuit networks. I just uh, messed around with this, got it to work the way I wanted to, and then called it a day. And then there's another element on this other side here. And what we're doing is calculating the number of actual signals. So all it does is divides the signal by itself and outputs a C. So if the signal doesn't exist, zero divided by zero, and then zero for C. But if there's any signal at all, it'll output a one for C. So basically it's just calculating if these signals exist. And since lead and tin do not exist, they don't output a C. But we do get a C for the rest of the signals. And the output of all of these devices is on a green wire. And I have two sets of poles here to follow it along where these are the signals going in and then the signals going out. We have 4C and then the erroneous 4 for lead and tin and then 321 with silicon, silver, and copper. And then also, air quotes, there is an invisible signal of iron. Iron would be here, but since it's the biggest signal, it is zero, but it is technically there. So then the next thing we do is take that C signal and remove the erroneous data. So it does iron, and if the signal is less than C, it can go through. So since lead and tin are equal to C because they are empty signals and they always will be, they are removed. So now the output is just the three signals that we actually want to compare. And technically it's four, but it's only showing three because iron is zero. But those are the four signals that we actually want to compare. So all of this was just to get it down to the four signals we wanted. And then this is where all the magic happens. Where it just compares against every signal. And it says, is this count bigger than every other signal? If so, 
output one. If not, output nothing. And since the way that this logic calculates, the largest signal here shows the highest priority for processing. So it's inverted. So since iron is the biggest signal, it has the lowest signal in this part of the calculation. So if we go over to silicon, since silicon is the biggest number, it outputs a one. And that's it. We get our one silicon. So that's what the logic said. It went through all of that and said, uh, turn on silicon. But we have a little bit of error checking back here. Because there is a unique situation that can occur. And that is what happens if none of these outputs are good. In other words, what happens if we're over 80,000 on, let's say, iron, tin, and silicon. So all of these have been canceled out. Well, you saw what happens when a signal disappears is that it still sends an erroneous signal. So if every single signal is bad, what it's going to do is send every signal through and say, turn them all on. So in the situation where the logic says run nothing, it will actually turn everything on. So we have a little uh, error checker here. And what it does is it calculates every signal times one and then counts it. And then over here, as long as those that count of signals is less than six, then they can be sent through. Because there is a certain situation where you might have a tie where two different lines might want to run because they have exactly the same number of resources. And that would only occur very briefly for a moment, but it can occur. So what this will do will allow a tie to go through. It won't allow a three way tie to go through, but that pretty much can't happen. But it will stop the signal if every warehouse is full. And then finally, what this does here is similar to how it was at the very beginning of this chain where iron times one and then output iron. It's basically removing that C signal just to clean it up so it's no longer there. And then finally the output is silicon. So we can kind of test this a little bit by going to our signal generators and making some false signals and seeing how it operates. One thing we can do is go to 10 and let's make it less than 80,000 so it'll be included in the calculation. So let's make it 30,000. So then there it is. Oh no, we don't have radar. We really need to put some more radars down. Let's see, why is all this running? Because it shouldn't be. Ah, that's actually kind of bad. It's running because that warehouse is full, but I'll just load a previous save so we're not uh, overloading because probably in a few moments we're going to get completely clogged up on tin here. But I wanted to do this to show how it works. So now all six signals are making it through and they're being calculated where iron is the biggest signal. Silicon is the smallest signal and it counts them up to do the error checking and then sends them through. But since every signal is less than six, it means there's no false data. So it sends all six signals through and then it calculates that silicon is the lowest number. And then it does the error checking and it passes, so it sends silicon through. So let's load the previous save here and turn that off. It always does a little honk the second you do that. Well, let's make a tie. Since silicon is the lowest, let's say we have 
30,000 silicon, and it'll be exactly. And let's say we have 30,000 copper. So, tin and letter blocked. But the other two signals go through. And then it counts them. But we have a perfect tie. So the output of copper is one. Nothing for iron because it's the biggest signal. And then the output of silicon is one. And then silver is three. So then it counts the number of signals we have, which is four. Removes the erroneous data of lead and tin. So now we're left with one, one, and three. So we have our tie. But because silver is the biggest number, it removes those ones. And now we're just left with silver as the output. So let's make a tie for an output here. Let's make silver 30,000 as well. So now we have a three-way tie between copper, silicon, and silver. Well, we have our three-way tie here of 111, but then nothing makes it through. We might want to have this be less than or equal to. There we go. We have our output of the three signals. The three signals get counted. Since they're less than six, they get passed through. So now that we have our three-way tie, it's saying run all three because they are tied for last place with the lowest quantity. So now let's check the extreme. What happens if every warehouse is full? say 85,000. We have 85,000 silver. Let's say we have 86,000 of tin. And 87,000 of copper. What happens now? Well, they all get error checked to see if they're above 80,000. And since they all are, no signal makes it through. So then they're compared with each other, but there's no signal, so nothing makes it through. All of these are blank up until we get to if they're checking to see if they're less than or equal to each other, which they all are, because none of them exist. So this is where the count happens. It checks each one to see how many we have. And in total, we have six signals, and they're all ones. And since they are not less than six, it outputs nothing. And that final output is nothing which is the behavior we'd want to see. And I loaded a previous save so we didn't produce all those extra materials. And there you go. That's how that system works. So it's telling us we need to produce a silicon. So now we need to actually set up the logic here. And that's going to have to wait until the next episode. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you later.